Welcome to Community Broadband Action Network's Lunch and Learn. This is our third in a series of monthly webinars, and today's topic is Show Me the Money. I'm Curtis Dean, uh, one of the co-founders of CBAN, and today I'm going to be working behind the scenes, just running all the tech here to hopefully have a good experience for everybody in our webinar. A reminder, this webinar is being recorded, so if you run into somebody who didn't get a chance to be part of it, today live. Uh, it'll be on the C-Band website as soon as we get edited and placed online. We want to extend a big thank you to our C-Band vendor members. These are the companies that have stepped up to the plate and are showing support for the Community Broadband Action Network. Uh, the dues that they are paying are helping support all of the efforts that we're putting into to help solve for better broadband in areas that uh, are in need of it desperately. Uh, so we want to thank these C-Band vendor members for stepping up to the plate and becoming vendor members. Our newest vendor member is Bear Communications. And thank you to Todd and his uh, team at Bear uh, for uh, joining on as a C-Band vendor member. Uh, they just joined up here about a week ago and uh, are doing some work in Indianola, Iowa as part of their fiber to the home build. So Bear Construction Communications, thanks for joining us. Next, we want to introduce our two speakers. On your right is Michael Maloney, and Michael is with D.A. Davidson, and uh, Michael's been involved in some of the municipal projects that have happened here in the Midwest in the past couple of years on the financing side. Todd Kielkoff, to your left, is with Kielkoff Advisory Services, and uh, Todd is CBAN co-founder as well as being someone who helps put these deals together. Gentlemen, tell us about yourselves. Thanks, Curtis. Uh, Michael Maloney from D.A. Davidson. Uh, we're a proud partner of the CBN network. Uh, some other on the line, I believe we've uh, been introduced in the past, but uh, we have done historically uh, been a leader in underwriting services on the financing side for municipalities in the state of Iowa, and also ranked number four in the nation. Uh, we've historically done a stiff amount of the, the work for the electric utilities municipally in Iowa, and that's led us to doing more and more work on the fiber broadband and telecom utility financing side. So uh, as this is the show me the money uh, lunch and learn topic, uh, Curtis was kind enough to include us to participate today and hopefully uh, visiting with us. And Todd will be able to share a little bit more about what we're seeing out there, what's been done before, what we're looking at now, and where we're going to be going from the financing standpoint. Todd? Sure. Uh, my name is Todd Kilcock and as a co-founder of CFAN and also work with many communities here in the state of Iowa early in the process where we're trying to work with governing boards and community champions and, and people in the communities that want to see networks happen. This is a topic that really gets people uh, confused early that they don't understand the process. And so, and what we'd like to do today is kind of work backward, forwards and then backwards and summarize so people in the decision-making uh, phase can understand the, the, there's not impediments that are brought up along the way, but the, there's a process involved with all this. And so I've worked with, uh, like I said, several communities on this topic and spoken at my AMU conferences on it and things of that nature. And so we just thought that uh, between the placement industry and the guidance industry is kind of what we have here today. And the two have to go hand in hand. Um, typically, we're both working independently for uh, the governing body or the, the staff or the community champions and so or even just the people of the town. So uh, we did that's how you get uh, I think a good dialogue here and perspective about um, how to keep the process moving forward and understand just a little bit today more about some of the complexities involved. Absolutely. Slideshow? Yeah uh, I think a good place to, to maybe just a, a brief overview are some of the, the recent uh, utilities that have financed uh, communications projects to build out uh, from a capital standpoint, uh, either an expansion or refinancing of outstanding debt. Uh, as many of you know, the communications utilities on the municipal side have uh, dated back to the legacy system, so in almost 20 years back in the state of Iowa. So we've seen uh, both from the coaxial kind of cable systems and now moving into either overbuilding those systems with an upgraded fiber system in the ground and then also here most recently from community called Waverly up in northeast Iowa and Indianola here south of the Des Moines metro uh, proceeding with a full citywide build out of a fiber broadband system. Uh, well those are the ones that have been completed historically there's also currently 
a half dozen that are nearing you know, finalizing engineering or a business plan processes that Todd alluded to that we'll talk a little bit more about here today uh, that are ready to go. So the expectation is you know, a year from now, this list could be another four or five or even six entities larger based on ones that are in progress, ready to go live, similar to what Indian Oil here achieved in recent months. I think the important thing people understand about this list is number one, it's fairly diverse in terms of economic uh, abilities of the town, you know, demographics and socioeconomics and things of that nature. Number two, um, you need to kind of see this as the reason the industry is actually lending money again. Um, if we go back to 2007, 2008, 2009, you know, the heart of the financial crisis, um, you had higher interest rates, but you also had more uncertainty, I think, because there hadn't been one in a while. Mm -hmm. And so lenders and uh, credit analysts and things of that nature weren't as comfortable with the whole way that we were going to do business planning that was going to be financeable. And so now we're in a different set of circumstances. There's these towns have established track history, and that track history is valuable for everybody else that comes later. And so that's kind of why I think we're seeing this this big little more inter, you know little little boom here in Iowa it's because number one we have a more of a demand need. Uh, number two we saw favorable interest rates. And number three these on the list have successfully gotten it done. Correct, and I, I think uh, just to dovetail on what Todd had to say there, you know, I think also if you go back 10 years, not just the financial realities, but also just the fact that we were kind of in the middle ground here between some of the legacy coaxial cable systems and sort of, uh, hey, what's gonna happen with things like the wireless cell uh, technology or, or, or cellular technology? What's gonna happen with the private providers? Are they going to step up? And I think 10 years later now, we've recognized that in a lot of these communities, uh, if we don't take it on ourselves from a municipal standpoint to, to put this infrastructure in, we don't know how long it's going to be before private industry reaches there. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the math that's changed for those folks, or, or I'd say not changed, but not evolved, maybe the way that we've seen historically. So uh, in terms of their business perspectives, uh, a number of these communities uh, are, are, especially communities similar to ones that we see around the state in Iowa, uh, are, are not going to be targets in the near term for these private entities, and hence the demand that Todd alluded to for the municipalities to start seriously looking at um, developing a capital and business plan to make these happen. Sounds good. So our, our next uh, kind of highlight here is we'll kind of walk you through what starts the entire process, which is the authority to borrow money. Well, even that, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we want to make sure is very clear here in Iowa is that for us to be able to move forward with uh, any type of communications utility entity, uh, we need to have the initial authority for that to be created. So that's really the incorporation aspect of this is that while we can do some initial exploration, uh, really in terms of digging in and starting to pursue the potential even for a telecommunications utility on the municipal side in Iowa, we need to hold a referendum to get that authority from the citizens. Now, I think both Curtis and Todd can speak with specific case examples over the last several years in terms of where we've seen very successful and very favorable turnout and, and very favorable results in terms of the establishment of those utilities. Um, while in the past we've seen this happen maybe in fits and starts with various communities in terms of uh, kind of community pushing for uh, municipal government structures to pursue this, uh, we've definitely seen a, 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 a definitely a, a growing rising tide of more and more of these happening and more and more folks at least considering getting started. So uh, that's that's the number one piece in terms of the establishment of the utility to take a look at this. And it goes hand in hand often as just a second referendum item for these uh, municipal utilities to be created with uh, board governance. So that can either be, hey, it, it's, it's a choice of this stays underneath the city council, this is a board, or it can be under an existing board. You know, often we'll see, a it's going to be the electric utilities existing board that is going to be the initial management structure, maybe even the long-term management structure for the telecommunications utility. But those are the two foundational aspects of getting the ball rolling from that standpoint. And the key is, once you get that silo defined legally, then it can have all the powers and authorities to implement whatever plan you want to do locally. Right. So <clears throat> whether that's uh, the, the revenue bonds or whether that is, and, and we'll get into some of these interfund loans, uh, the 
in the end, you have one management authority, and that can be separate from how you finance everything. You still try to bring other the other pieces of that city government uh, to the table however you can. So as we walk through this today, keep that in mind that, that the management and the authority uh, starts high, but it can involve a lot of different pieces. And, and I think it's, as Todd's alluded there, just tying a couple of details together, that initial referendum for the establishment of the utility really lays the groundwork where we wouldn't necessarily need to pursue an additional referendum to proceed with either financing or any part of the plan. It puts the management solely onto that managing group, whether it's the board, the council, et cetera. Uh, the only time that you'd need an additional referendum would be at your discretion if the community felt it was in their best interest to pursue something like uh, citywide general obligation, property tax borrowing for some of the capital need. Um, but otherwise, from a traditional revenue borrowing, revenue backed borrowing standpoint, while there are some intricacies with telecommunications financing here, especially in Iowa, uh, it does not pr provide for an additional referendum, a simple public hearing process you can use to proceed. Curtis, you can go on to the next slide. Sorry. Easier said than done, sir. <laughs> yeah, we're good there. So I, I think uh, this is something that, that Todd's talk alluded to here in his last piece of it, but you know, what's really important here in terms of Iowa as it approaches communications utilities is that we've got a standard uh, per state law that precludes a community from subsidizing a telecommunications utility. And when you think about a community telecommunications utility uh, and, and operating as an independently siloed utility fund, obviously we've got two things that are very unique as compared to a community's water utility or sewer utility or even electric utility as the fact that those three other entities that I described have one, a long-term operating history that we can rely upon from both the credit and security perspective, but also secondly, they have monopoly control over the constituents that they serve. So there is no com competing for people in town and the water, sewer, or often the electric utility side and those are very defined who can and can't be served. When we start talking about the communications utility on the municipal side, we're opening a different avenue because of the competitive nature. That communication utility is gonna be offering services, often we think of the typical triple play of cable television, internet, and phone services, and we can discuss some of the alternative revenue streams in the, down the road, but really we're competing against private vendors uh, for those services. So that's the unique aspect and also what's led to those statutes in the code that preclude us from having uh, any type of um, Basically subsidization is the right word to think about what we can and can't do And the definition of that subsidization rule has kind of changed I think over the last 10 years. It's gotten tighter from just Okay, you can't transfer money in to support operations it's actually now, do you, if you're borrowing money internally or you have different arrangements using your other municipal assets, that, that interest rate has to be reasonable, reasonable um, in order to avoid the subsidization. The same thing with your cost allocation formulas of your overhead. Uh, there's just a little more scrutiny on that, especially if you're borrowing money. Yeah. So there's, you just try to keep those two things separate. You have, tax exempt rules, financing things mm -hmm. um, on private use and things that's at the federal level and at the state level, we've got this subsidization thing that we kind of have to work through and then those two things often lead to different strategies in the business plan. Correct. And I think it's going to vary from community to community. Mm -hmm. Something that's listed here at the bottom of the table is talking about a lease of shared assets. Now, I think often when we think about starting a project like this, we're thinking that we're starting with potentially a blank slate, that we're putting all the new assets into the ground, we're putting all new equipment in, and that we need to be thinking about those assets as potentially being shared between different utilities. I think the easiest way to get there with sharing capacity with a telecommunications utility, whether it's an electric entity or water or sewer potentially, is as we look to the future and think about opportunities related to smart grid, or smart metering. Um, while those may be something that we can see down the road, we're gonna to wanna to have actionable steps identified about how we're going to get there. 
that's talking about things that we're going to do. I mean, something that's often overlooked in initial planning purposes is what assets do we currently have that could be shared? So that could be anything as simple as, well, you know, we put fiber in when we did an undergrounding project for the electric utility years ago, or something we saw, you know, coming out of the 2008, 2009 recession with some of the ARA funding was that we saw, you know, maybe downtown corridor projects where these areas were able to see dark fiber assets installed. That's maybe only a half million or a million dollars worth of assets, but really needs to be considered as we start talking about the matrix of where are these funding sources coming from, where are these capital assets from, and how can we leverage what's existing there in terms of reducing the burden during the startup period to the telecommunications utility. So we have the anti, you know, um, uh, rules as, as relates to subsidization, we also need to think creatively about what we're actually going to try to be doing long term within the community. And it's really ideal if you're already going to be doing capital projects in a five year plan and you're looking ahead five years to say, I'd like to be in a spot where I have X amount already done on my conduit uh, because, and so I'm going to build some of that into my electric utility five year capital improvement plan. Right. Uh, those two things can become really cost effective then. And you don't run into the subsidization rules then as much, um, especially if you can run just a, an extra conduit. And all you have to do is an alternate bid, and you can define that alternate expense, and, and that's the telecom one. So it's really about, you've seen some of these communities that were on that previous list, I think really thought ahead, um, you know, and, and did a nice job of trying to at least get 10 or 15% of that base level investment made that are very affordable without worrying about it. Correct. It's when we gotta do things together at the same time um, or one ahead of the other, like you said, uh, the telecom ahead of something, that we have to do a lot more uh, piecemealing of, of the framework as we go through the business plan. Absolutely. And I think something identified here that Todd touched on, just the other key point of the slide, are, are kind of these surplus loans. You know, we talk about the anti-subsidization laws, what that means is we can't just send money back and forth from other city funds like we otherwise could do under some of the surplus loan statutes um, or, or surplus financing statutes within the state code. Uh, there's a clear uh, formula for designating surplus from any city uh, fund, simply a utility fund, where we'd have to have a certain amount of operating reserves on hand sufficient not to just cover you know, um, going forward operational costs and any other debt or transfers, but also those rainy day funds. Uh, when we certify those dollars, if it's not to a communications utility, we can use those funds maybe as we'd like to do, you know, from water to sewer for a short term project that may or may not be repaid and, and at an interest rate return or, or some type of arrangement that's agreed upon between the city and those funds. We're more highly regulated in Iowa when it comes to using surplus funds as they're designated to be given or used by the telecommunications utility. As, as Todd had mentioned, we need to clearly identify the repayment back to the fund that had the surplus there and identify a reasonable rate of return. So we can't get as cute as we maybe once would in terms of helping support the communications utility upfront portion. That being said, we still see this as a valuable puzzle piece mm -hmm. um, at, at the political considerations, obviously the operating entity and their board or council, but it's something we wanna look at and make sure we're paying attention to early in the process and, and not getting uh, you know, overly aggressive in, in how we think we might be able to support this startup entity. So most of what you're seeing on the, on the screen for those the last couple of slides is those are all ands is what I would say. Yeah. They're not ors. Um, these are layered in with different levels of agreements and protections and, and things at different risk levels in order to make a complete project financeable to the ultimately to the bondholder. Right. So the, the portion that's a revenue bond, a pure revenue bond that is only secured by the revenues of the telecommunication utility is what we're most trying to build a bubble around in order to get the best interest rates and the best terms. So everything else is an and, but it, they're valuable ands. Yep. And, and think about it as skin in the game in the yeah. community. It's the part of kind of the equity, uh, a, a slice of the pie that's equity and goodwill that, hey, something else in the city is supporting this long term. So well, we may have some initial startup growing pains, if you will, in terms of getting things moving in a competitive environment. We've got some buffer there, and that's what these ands are providing for time. 
Percy now on the next slide. So yeah, if you want to kind of walk through what you see sure. the process being, uh, just to give everybody a high level overview of how financing works with everything else going on with engineering. Sure, I, I think uh, a couple of good models have definitely come out of the last couple of years uh, as folks like Todd and Curtis uh, have been around and, and gotten involved earlier, early in the process as communities look about the initial feasibility of proceeding with one of these projects. Uh, whether you are aware of or uh, are undertaking currently or have explored feasibility or pre-feasibility for the potential success of one of these utilities or entities in your community, uh, that feasibility step is really just uh, an initial glance at understanding what the long-term goals are. Uh, hopefully, however, from that feasibility study, we're able to glean, hey, can we take this to some additional professionals to get a look to see if one, this is a viable project that if we go get up and running and hit reasonable take rates, take rates, which would mean subscriber levels for cable TV, internet, phone, those legacy triple play services, are we going to be a cash flow positive entity over time? So that's kind of one. And then the second piece, getting back to what Todd had alluded to on the previous slide, is do we think we've got the groundwork for a financeable project? I know there's significant additional business planning and engineering work. The earlier we can start working through some of the potential logistics of getting one of these up and running from a financing standpoint, making sure the numbers make sense, it's probably a good analysis to consider before going and outlaying the funds necessary for a full engineering study and the related business plan documents that are going to bring you to another you know, um, decision point at some point in the future. So uh, I think we've been able to narrow down our um, range of outcomes, if you were, during that feasibility process because of the work you know, I've definitely seen from, from Curtis in terms of what kind of partnerships are out there. Can we take an early look in terms of who third party vendors are? How much knowledge can we have about the ultimate project rather than taking a very uh, conservative swing from not only capital project amounts, but also the operating costs of running the system based on the number of subscribers that we expect. I think where we were a few years ago, or even before, we were talking about trying to do everything independently and then saying, look, if we can create partnerships and economies of scale, we just know it'll be better. And therefore, if it works at this most conservative point, we know we've got a good project and we'll figure it out later. I think that's changed for the better because we've identified a more realistic range of the ultimate outcomes by identifying partnerships and, and, and teams earlier in the process to basically have a better, clear understanding going into engineering what we want to actually get done. Curtis, maybe you can chime in better here too. To I'll, I'll stay off the camera, but I will. I, I just The way I look at it is it's kind of like bringing things better into focus, yeah. right? It's like if you're, if you're looking at something from a distance, it maybe is a little blurry. You might be able to make out, oh, that's a car. Um, but you really need to zoom in and take a better focused look to understand, okay, this is a four-door sedan, and now let's zoom in, and oh, that's a Chrysler whatever, you know? So you start with that big picture. It's a little fuzzy, but you start to make out, oh, this looks like something we could do, and then you bring those other, um, other ways to bring new knowledge in to, you, to add to what you've learned to focus that picture in so you get a better idea of what you're looking at. <laughs> And it's all about trying to hone in the risk um, so we can communicate back to uh, potential financiers about what you see as the, the risk of the financial model being wrong. And then there's a risk to the governing body that you've made an investment in something in terms of the full engineering, the, the full engineering design that, that can't produce a, a, a operation that avoids all the legal pitfalls and and has a nice uh, launch especially yeah. especially on the launch side i guess is why i was trying to go with that yeah i think it smooths out the overall process because we're doing some of this due diligence earlier in the process we don't end up in a situation where we get you know the final engineering or business business plan considerations and then well let's take it or leave it we've got to do it one way or another or we've got to scramble to figure this out you know ideally we'd like to have Kind of all the trains getting to the station at the same time where we're waiting on really just some of the final legal considerations and a yes no this is the project we're doing and a yes no on let's go and try to secure this financing 
so that we've got things teed up. Um, I think this also really helps when we talk about timing of these projects and not to go too far out of my element, but I think folks from an operational perspective understand some of the seasonal challenges we have, especially in Iowa, where we don't want to have a situation where we're having a report prepared, you know, over the winter, we get after the first of the year, and instead of being able to bid the project, we're scrambling for months, and we could potentially lose a season or a year uh, in terms of getting construction done. Um, you know, time is of the essence. I don't mean to be cliche, but it's a bigger part of the picture here as we're working along a timeline. And the smoother we can make that process, the more efficiently we can proceed. Mm -hmm. And it's really that three-legged stool. You've got the designing, you know, the designing construction prep going on at the same time as the business plan development and governance. I would say, you know, feeling in the community, feeling comfortable about that plan. And then the third piece is the actual financing. Right. And we're going to get into a little bit about what that means, but there's. If you try to close those three out at the same time, um, you're just refining that model and then going from a model of spreadsheets to implementation. Yep. And it, it's just, it's not quite hitting the head, you know, right on the nail, but you're certainly lining, lining them up and saying, this is how we're going to get, get to bidding and get bidding and construction, construction into operations. I just figured out something cool. You can live edit on a PowerPoint while it's being shown on the screen. So <laughs> I'm sorry I corrected the typo, but I also put in the text number. If you have a question today, you can text it to me at uh, the number you see there on the bottom of this slide, 515-650-0251. You can also raise your hand within the uh, uh, platform here. Uh, and you can also uh, send a chat uh, and the chat window, you can uh, type your question in there. So I just want to let people know if you have questions, those are a couple of different ways to do that. And uh, I, I will, I will, keep, I will move back behind and, and, and be quiet again because I have a squeaky chair. Next slide, I assume, sirs. Yeah. Oh, good. This is just something we want to lay out there in terms of consideration. I think something we maybe been focused on here is really the you know, owner operator model where the municipality is going to run the show. As we've seen that be maybe the most effective and efficient opportunity for those that have pursued these to date. Doesn't mean that there's other options that are out there in terms of partnering with third parties um, or other types of structures. We're not as uh, focused on talking about those different options today per se, but we know they're out there. I think just the, the, the reason we want to just hit on this is the different types of portions of assets that are going to be a piece of your initial capital spend and, and just articulating where those are coming from, who's going to have some responsibility for it. Uh, rather than necessarily dwell on any one item, I think this was more just a tee up that the fact there's multiple pieces of consideration here. So as we refer to some of the different items that are going to be funded in the future or, or how different pieces get bid, we just want to identify that there are a number of moving considerations here that need to be considered separately, both in terms of how they may or may not be financed, also in terms of how they may or may not be implemented in terms of timing, and ultimately whose responsibility lies for the performance of those entities. Yeah, um, you know, some of these get into what's working capital items versus what's initial construction items versus you know, and how long you want to lend, you want to be borrowing money for on some of these items. So as you look at, um, you know, when we look at either a private-public partnership or some alternative financing of internal loans, um, which you try to mirror, you try to match these. I mean, you see the, yeah. the risk profile of these assets. That's right. That's right. We, we really want to take a, a good thought process at each one of these swings. I think something that's most obvious to folks, especially as we see more cord cutting uh, happen from a national perspective, we've seen that uh, not necessarily be as prevalent uh, in Iowa, and especially in a lot of the communities that we visit with. We understand that uh, providing some type of cable TV service or replacement, and that's probably a conversation for another day, but those types of services are gonna have to be part of our initial operating package that we can provide to customers. Well, just because we wanna provide it today, doesn't necessarily know, mean that we're going to be doing that 10 years from now. Right. So partnering with someone, uh, for example, the Cedar Falls Utilities uh, Cable TV head end agreement, where we've got the flexibility where we're not necessarily going to be having legacy head end equipment sitting 
in our backyard, in our offices, eight, 10 years from now, might be a really effective thing to consider. And we're talking about each of these components from a life cycle perspective, as Todd said. We know equipment in the technology space is not gonna have a particularly long, um, useful life's not the right word, but a, a relevant life in terms yeah. of being the latest life. and greatest tech <laughs> technology. Uh, so for those, some of those components, we really wanna be careful about how quickly we think for placement cycle is for something like routers or set-top boxes for the cable TV. Those are things that we don't want to think about in the same box as the actual fiber assets or, or land or building acquisitions that are part of getting the overall utility started. Our expectation for those is that we're going to get 30 to 50 or maybe even longer periods of time out of those assets. So we really want to be thinking about these individually as part of a whole rather than as just one large project that we're working on. Yeah, I guess an example of that, I know we've worked through one plan where you're looking at 20 year borrowing ability on a revenue side, revenue note for that boring and, and, and glass in the ground. And then maybe the interfund loan piece is about the working capital because a bank would look at that differently. So that's a different series and saying, well, if you can you know, do that through an interfund loan, that could be refinanced two or three times if needed based on performance or unexpected. And then maybe the middle piece of that is where's the stability on the shared use of assets uh, with an electric utility or a gas utility or, or even that um, that uh, capital capital loan note authority mm -hmm. you know so we just kind of piece those together based on some of these asset classes it's kind of how the financing like i said it, it's different than what you do in a feasibility study that that's deeper just because the dive into what resources are there and governance authority discussions um, in terms of how you're going to share them in that financing, and that's not going to happen in a feasibility study, or else your feasibility study is going to be a year long. So that's why you might have a simplistic number on amortization, saying, "Oh, we're," but hopefully that's high, and then you work your way in on how to cheapen it right. by layering in how to finance individual assets. I think the the, the short summary of what Todd had to say is we're we're trying to identify these as part of an overall life cycle. Mm -hmm. So we have initial capital spend. Often we want to be looking at a 15 to 20 year overall life cycle from this initial project. In that life cycle, we're probably not going to be bearing fiber again, especially if we're doing a citywide system. But we could be doing two or three equipment replacement cycles over the course of that 15 to 20 year period. So we're going to have a few hoops to jump through, as Todd alluded to previously, both from a federal level in terms of tax status, a state level in terms of legality and anti subsidization considerations. We also just want to be prudent financially here mm -hmm. and really think long term beyond just our initial two to three year capital spend and a five year CIP as we often do for our legacy utility businesses. We really want to think about this holistically and we want flexibility is the name of the game. I think we're going to allude to that further on the, on the yeah. remaining slides. That's my cue. <laughs> Apparently easier said than done. Here we go. There we go. And I don't know that we've got a whole lot more here, uh, Curtis, on from what we just kind of discussed in this slide. We can probably move on to the next one. It's just, I think the key pieces that I'd like to point out is we talked about municipal owner operator. That's what we talked about kind of as part of the initial, you know, feasibility studies that we've done historically up until the last couple of years, where it just assumes that we're going to do everything independently. If we can create any economies of scale or partnerships, that just makes things better. Um, we've recognized the fact that we're going to end up more into that second column um, and, and some type of white label type service provision on, you know, relying on third parties of some kind, especially as it relates to probably cable TV, head end, and potentially on the phone services. It's just, there's just some reasonable pathways to follow through on. So we can maybe start the discussion there by working with the team earlier in the process rather than trying to figure that out after we've got a full engineering and business plan completed. So, you know, I just want to be clear there's a spectrum of ways these get done. We've seen what's working as a very good model in Iowa and, and just wanted to articulate kind of those pros and cons and, and kind of the different ways these might shake out between the two. So not to dwell on this slide, but just a better visualization of what we talked about previously. Right. From a financing standpoint, you get into these things helping out both on your Primarily on your on your debt service coverage ratio. So you borrowed money in uh, these different layers. Um, you have to make enough money to repay that back. And if that can be going 
under a private contract versus your firm employees or capital up front because your partner ends up financing some of those over their seven or eight years of your contract that keeps off of your balance sheet and your income statement and makes a lot of those numbers look better. Uh, that's one of the roles here at CBAN really is to be able to have a marketplace, a little bit better marketplace about who wants to be at the table mm -hmm. and who wants to not only do it from a service standpoint or they're scaling, they're growing a, a business that might provide jobs in, in a region, but also um, how do we make those that communication better between the people who are looking two or three years down the road for projects and people who are looking to provide those services two or three years down the road. Right. Because it, it should be a win-win uh, for everybody. Well, I think the last piece that I just want to articulate on this, you know, as we're looking at, you know, talking about lowering the cost and economy scale and efficiencies, I don't want to miss the perspective too that from marketing any potential financing to prospective investors, being able to talk about upfront in a concrete way that we're going to partner with XYZ firm for both our phone switching and phone regulatory is going to give some comfort and understand that we really thought about this operationally and this is why we're going to be a long-term going concern as an entity. You know, um, many communities might be blessed with some really technical people that can come in and, and, and help operate one of these utilities, but the idea that we're going to find a few dozen individuals that we want to train up to really understand how to file the regulatory paperwork federally on phone um, is it, kind of, you know, a logistical challenge that we can help navigate out of. And it's a very good answer for potential investors to say, we've addressed that already. Here's our plan. We've got it under control. That's a much better story than well, when you lend us the money, we'll figure it out at the back. <laughs> Yep. So yeah, just clip through kind of the process. Uh, so after you've kind of got these things framed out, then the process is you update the draft of the business plan document uh, for review based on RFI results, government body priorities, get those aligned early. It's one of the things we're really encouraging instead of just having it be a one solution driven or staff driven because by this point, you probably anchored your governing body around some expectations about whether it be the revenue pricing or things of that nature, and, and those really get into the financing model. Mm -hmm. And if those two aren't aligned, then um, that's where you're gonna get some hiccups. So formal adoption of a business plan, again, that becomes more of a, a risk assessment from the community standpoint that says, yes, we believe that these numbers are attainable given all the information we've collected. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, that can be probably both a, a checkpoint should you keep proceeding and then the final business plan that's going to drive the remaining steps so yeah can you walk, kind of walk through what you see at the financing about how what's important about that yeah absolutely so i think we've got again a match of just you know logistically prudent things to talk about like adopting the business plan is a clear formal step that we are proceeding with this plan and will continue to monitor and use this and won't be set in stone but this is the roadmap for how we expect to operate our utility in the near future. I think the second piece of that is also, you know, in, in terms of making that decision point, we've joked about not red lights, but orange or yellow lights in terms of some of these different steps. So as we kind of have the blank space on the previous page, one of the things I would say there is that's because it's open at that point. Did we meet the expectations that we articulated earlier? And where does that leave us? Do we want to start running out with bids for potential contractors and pursue financing? Do we want to take a pause and think about what else we need to consider here or if we need an alternative option? Um, is it clear that this isn't something that the municipality can run? And at that point, do we pause for now? Do we look at other avenues for partnership? Or is this something where, hey, we've got engineering design done, this is a valuable document for somebody, and perhaps we can you know, use this as a roadmap for a private entity to, to produce the service. I think the long-term goal here is to bring you know, uh, fiber broadband high-speed internet for the purpose of long-term economic development and vibrancy of these communities. You know, we think this is a, a model that's out there that others have used that's been very effective at doing that, but at the end of the day, we've got other considerations, and I think that's one of the decision points. And at this point, you know, this is where I typically step back from a process because we've gotten it to the point where this is probably as refined within 85% of what we can do. And you're out there talking to actual lenders. 
right. At that point, we've got something that's more actionable that we can start talking about. Look, hey, I think we're going to be pursuing something. Here's what we're looking at with this community. Um, we're going to be getting ready to green light this project from a financing standpoint, putting our initial feelers out there to get that feedback for the board at that inflection point, maybe one of those yellow or orange lights we talked about to say, hey, we're ready to go. If the board is ready to do this, here are the remaining steps to pursue the financing. And if we get the financing through, we're going to go. And I think the if we get the financing completed is an important thing to point out here. You know, unlike your um, you know, monopoly businesses on the revenue side like water, sewer, electric utilities, or the property tax backed geo bonds for a community, uh, where we have you know, effectively 100% certainty that the financing can be completed, it's just a matter of at what rate. On um, telecommunications utility side, especially the startup utilities, it is a number less than 100%, even if we've got a very good business plan. There are challenges in terms of the competitive environment. Uh, we need to have a good, sturdy plan, and it's going to be a all hands on deck process to go secure that financing from lenders and, and, and really work through that as a, if we get this done, we're going. So that's a really important inflection point there that we've got. What we wanna do is make sure when we put that full court press on with financing institutions, that this is an actionable project and that we want to narrow that timeline down to a couple months max. You don't want to be running around trying to market a financing for months on end. At some point, someone's going to smell that no one's willing to finance the transaction and we go back to square one. So it's very important that we've got all our ducks in a row. Again, we want to make sure that we've got everything figured out from a tax status standpoint at the federal level. We want to make sure we're hitting all the boxes from a legal standpoint within the state. And finally, we want to make sure that we're doing something that we believe is prudent in the long-term financial interest of the community. So once we've got those aligned and we've got that engineering done, we've got that business plan, we can start thinking about getting the remaining trains to the station. There's really, you have two, com two communities you're talking to in terms of the lending community. You have the banking community, whether these are private placement loans or a syndicate of banks who are taking on that, that risk. Right. Oh, and the actual bond market, which I think a lot of municipalities are more used to um, the, okay, we're going to get rated and then here we go. We just, some bank, you know, we bid it and it goes. Right. This is either a combination of the two or, or a lot of private placement because they really have to understand that business. Plan. Right. And, uh, and as, as Todd alluded to, in the municipal bond market, they're used to seeing, you know, prepackaged transactions that often look pretty similar to one another where they're just trying to understand the different credit nuances that make one deal different from the next. And the bond rating agencies can help support that. Often that's not gonna be a great fit for the type of communications utility financing that we're talking about, mostly because of the startup nature. And that fact, we're gonna be doing a little bit deeper level of scrutiny in terms of the security and credit pledge that is there with individual and prospective lenders. So we're really going kind of door to door with the folks that may be interested, really walking them through that business plan, really walking through the engineering and, and helping them understand why this is a project that's going to perform, why the people that are going to be operating the project are going to be successful or have been successful elsewhere, and making it clear that while there is some risk associated with this in the short term, the long term standpoint, it's a viable project that is going to produce positive cash flow. And you know, the, the bottom line is just like you need to have a technology champion or community development champion your community, then at the lending side, you have to have a champion within that financial institution that really wants to get this loan made uh, for the right reasons and that they can then go to their superiors or their loan committees in order to get those approved. And that's where I think, I'm not sure the municipal market always understands the banking market. That's right. And the, that's where really lending that is what that, that plan is. It's, it's not just a set of spreadsheets. It's what's going to be taken to other people in a few weeks. Yep. in order to make decisions. Because like you said, you can't dance around for eight or 10 weeks because right. their capital has other has other other places to go if it's not in your community. Right. They're make, you're getting judged on your ability to deliver on time because they need to deploy that capital um, in a timely manner for them to hit their performance targets. Right. That's right. So that, that's just something I think that everybody, that's why all this, as you say, get the trains in on time really makes a bigger difference, uh, especially if you have a syndicate of three or four banks taking this loan on. Well, and I think, again, this goes back to getting involved earlier in the process and reviewing the financial perspective and what might be out there for a borrowing consideration. Uh, you know, this is 
uh, a lot easier process to manage if we can identify here's some of the pitfalls and, and here's what we're going to need from you know, other funds of the city. Here's what we're going to need to start considering to make this project cash flow in a way that's going to be attractive to investors. Uh, you know, I, I have a vested interest here in seeing these projects go. We don't want to be out marketing a potential financing that we don't believe in. So I think that's the other piece of getting involved early is just being that kind of check over the shoulder on the financial side that says, yeah, we're going in the right direction. If this produces as we expect it to on the business plan side, we know this is a financial project. You know, if we're ever getting a red flag thrown up there, we either need to think about alternative options or be cautious about proceeding through any additional steps. How are we doing on time, Curtis? We have about 15 minutes, sir. Okay. I'm going to move to the next yeah. slide just because. I think we're kind of, yeah, right. And some things up. The, getting to the end here. So, yeah, I think we just want to talk a little bit about okay, we've got this all down. Um, we know what type of interest rate we're looking at. Um, what, are, what are they really looking at in terms of borrowing ratios and things like that? What do we have to hit? Sure. I think what we're and we want to refer back to one of the pieces we talked about earlier, which is really kind of some type of equity ratio where, you know, there's some skin in the game from some other entity within the community, you know, whether that's the traditional, you know, reliance somewhat on the shared assets with the electric utility or some dark fiber that's already within the community. We want to count those portions plus any potential portion to be financed by entities and secured by revenues that are not coming from this startup telecommunications entity. Uh, there, there's a different level of that it's high depending on the size of the community and, and how strong the projections are from a take rate standpoint. Obviously, the more subscriber penetration that we need for the community, uh, the higher potential risk because the slower we are to meet those projections, the longer it's going to take to repay the debt. That being said, alternatively, if we don't need a, a big barrier to meet some of those take rate levels to produce revenue sufficient to pay for the capital expenses, um, that's going to make it a lot easier and we might not need that some type of equity or skin in the game to get things financed. So that's sort of step one in terms of what we want to articulate. But we also want to make sure that we're meeting some of those tried and true municipal bond metrics, regardless of whether we go through the bond market or the direct loan placement route. We want to make sure that we've got successful debt coverage. So kind of thinking of like uh, EBITDA, but the net revenues bill for debt and debt service coverage margins there. In short, what we need to be able to demonstrate in any municipal revenue financing is that we've got a dollar in change for every dollar of debt payments. And that's from a net revenue perspective. So operating revenues, less operating expenses. You know, I think a pretty good standard on that is we might have a legal minimum that we can get to of something like a dollar ten for every dollar of debt payment. That's our legal minimum. Mm -hmm. We're gonna do something if we don't get there. It's a lot easier said than done with water rates when we've got a captive audience then we've got with a startup telecommunications utility where we're going to be more sensitive to the pricing for those programs and we can't just make all the rates five percent higher and assume that we're going to continue to get the market share that we're projecting so we want to make sure we've got some buffer in there after the initial few year period we can get flexible with these terms because mm -hmm. of the types of investors we're talking to that we're going to be producing sufficiently more than those legal covenants so if it's a dollar ten for every dollar dollar payment that we've got from a legal covenant standpoint, we call it a dollar and 30 cents that we want to try to manage to just to be on the safe side. That gives us some cushion. You want to be conservative with those estimates in the first three to five years because we want to make sure that we've got plenty of room. And to that point, we want to make sure we get all the capital that we need upon the start. We don't want to get $5 million for a $7 million project and just plan on borrowing the other two later. That's fine. If the last money in is going to potentially come from other city funds with the electric utility on a surplus loan or interfund loan of some kind, uh, that's acceptable. But if we're expecting to be going out to the market or to other lenders, oh, two years down the road, if we need the extra two million, that's not going to exist there. We're going to have additional covenants in place that restrict our ability to do so. One and two, it's a really tough credit story to ask for more money when you don't have anybody actually producing revenues for the system. So a lot of times when we're looking at the creative solutions, uh, we're looking at how to fill the gaps in these ratios. So that's kind of how this ties in to probably kind of our next little free-for-all segment here, if I'm remembering right, on our, um, yeah. One more, Curtis. Yeah, we're gonna do that one. So, yeah, the road to closing. So uh, then we'll come, make, come back, maybe kind of give an idea about how some, some of the communities we're seeing with gaps sure. are trying to fill those. Sure.
Yeah, I think just overall, again, the transit to the station thing, I think is the best yeah. approach. You know, um, the, the main piece is that we've got a business plan complete and we're working on, on finalizing engineering. What that means is we want to really be clear about what our ultimate timeline is going to be. We talked about seasonal effects on that, just good time to get contractors lined up, good time to purchase equipment. Can we get a full season of actually getting in the ground to put some of this fiber uh, actually installed? Uh, that's, a, that's a timing process, you know, um, and what we want to make sure that we're doing is, hey, we can go start soliciting bids for some of this work. We've got to make it contingent on getting the financing in place. So that timing can be lined up so that when we start having access to those dollars, uh, that we're able to go and spend them on the contracts to kind of get up and going. Some of the equipment pieces that are there may or may not be able to be, you can wait a little bit until you've got the money in hand to kind of get those equipment uh, items lined up, but you again are going to want to have good context for what you're going to purchase, yeah. and you're just waiting to pull the trigger. Yeah, and especially a lot of I think that we're used to doing like one big bond issue in the municipal world, and then we sit on the cash and we have two year drawdown schedules. That's not the way typically these go. So, when we talk about layering these different sources of funds, and they come in at different for different purposes, and they're coming in at a different time, so you're lowering the risk that somebody else's money needs to be used for what you're. Mm -hmm trying to get accomplished in whatever phase you're in, and then also you're just lowering your total interest costs because you're waiting on that first dollar revenue on the utility. Right, so we do it more of a, as a commercial drawdown loan, as a true municipal bond, where we're just gonna each month have those invoices either from the contractor or invoices for the equipment we purchased, and we ask for funds to be forward uh, through the loan, uh, pay those invoices, pay our contractors. We only pay interest on what we've borrowed to date. And that's exactly what Todd was alluding to. We're just gonna find every way to lower the cost impact, especially in the early years as we're ramping up. And yeah, going back to that, then when we when you've laid all that plan and you see the road and when you come back and see some roadblocks um, along the way of that business plan or somewhere between the business plan and the execution stage, that then you we've just got to look at it and say, okay, what else is out there? Whether you need to look at uh, you know any you know, rust funding or whether private partner funding um, come in where you're leasing some things from a partner through a rate that you can do a buyout after 10 years or maybe they're leasing you're leasing to them just to get a retail service in for a while mm -hmm. you have you know we've seen that in Colorado and especially where they have the right to buy out their partners um, in order to municipalize later um, those are some of the things I think some of the thinner ratio projects um, have at their disposal. Um, but again, it's about, it's, we circle all the way back to that RFI process. The people that can help you have to know that you're looking. You can't wait until you hit the roadblocks and then say, oh, now I'm wanting to go out and look. So that's part of what I think we've seen and uh, what we try to accomplish is we, we were giving people options in that business planning before you hit the roadblock on financing in order to say, we know the two or three people we can call and still get this thing as the engineering is coming in. Right, right. I think that's just, you know, identifying what those uh, places where we can, you know, navigate and, and, and ship if we need to, depending how some of the final numbers come back. It's something that heck of a lot easier to articulate up front and work from that menu of solutions we previously offered, rather than to be scrambling at the end to find those partners and find those, you know, opportunities. Yeah, and by that time your community you know, by the time we get down to this, your community is anchored around that you're going to do this project. Right. Um, regardless whether you've taken that legal step, and governing boards and bodies may feel like, oh, I've got flexibility because so and so told me I do. Well, yeah, you do, but the question is, do you have that political flexibility? Sure. Um, that's what we're trying to build into this process a little bit better is so um, you have more likelihood that you're going to walk all the way through this and be. Uh, pleased with the results versus surprise. Yeah. So at this point, Curtis, uh, I believe that's kind of our slideshow. So, all right. Well, we'll, we'll open it up to any questions. If anybody has a question, you can use the uh, chat function within the webinar software or the Q&A function. Either one of those will get our attentions, uh, um, our attention collective. Anyway, um, if you have a question, you can do that. You can also text you want to write this phone number down, it's 515-650-0251. And you can text a question to that 
or use the uh, function on on the uh, webinar software. Um, while we wait for a second to see if we have any questions come in, I'll stand behind so you guys have to look at me. That means you're looking at the camera too. <laughs> so um, what what are some of the you know you guys outlined a pretty careful timeline here about how you go about doing this. Um, is there a risk there? You, you mentioned the political risk that you know you, you get farther along than you think you are. Is there a risk that um, people try to jump the cart here and try to try to get something started before they're ready? I think on the uh, the governance side, especially that if you um, if you yes, <laughs> <laughs> it's mainly if you I think too deep too fast. Um, in terms of, well, they did it over here in this community, so we can automatically just do it. And and it needs to be, I think, the, the layered approach of uh, making some communities have been able to go straight through fe feasibility study because they had really high confidence, I think, that they could make the financing work. Mm -hmm. But the ones that don't should go ahead and, and promise things that they can't deliver. Where that's where we've seen pre feasibilities trying to come up, let's get that answer off the table first, do you even want to go through this? Mm -hmm. um, because here we kind of know the benchmarks about um, what risk tolerances are going to need to be there. I don't see it as much on the result side as I do the risk tolerance side. Right. And I think that goes back to making sure that the elected or appointed officials are understanding what's going on. I think it's uh, very easy, especially if we're doing something like monthly board meetings where hey, the staff might be working with professionals behind the scenes on the communications utility concept, but it's the last 10 minutes of a two hour board meeting once a month. <laughs> and all of a sudden we've got a lot of decision points that are there that maybe haven't been as clearly articulated to the decision makers. And I think that can lead to a little bit of confusion or consternation on their part. So it's less about the actual time, I think, and the depth of which we've been able to communicate all the various factors from the business planning perspective to engineering to the financial so that when it's clear we've got everybody lined up, we've kind of stacked up the cards or dominoes and when it says go, we knock them down rather than a situation where we're wondering what exactly we're trying to achieve even though the professionals have finished maybe their actionable items. And there's no such thing as a cookie cutter. And no, no. we all, uh, in municipalities I've dealt with, um, you know, they want to, uh, look to you know their big brothers and how they did it mm -hmm. and they need to understand that well how they did it may have happened 15 or 20 years ago mm -hmm. and the circumstances have changed the market has changed the laws are to change so you really need although you can learn a lot from those folks you really have to take a look at it on your own basis and understand that you got to make it work under the way your community operates sure yeah your community and the stakeholders need to learn how to learn uh, and go through the process because it's going to be unique. It's, it's, we can provide all of the framework around, the, you know, we kind of laid out the major components of that financing plan uh, and how we can get there. Uh, but it's, it really, like you said, Curtis, it's about what's what do you have and how are you willing to, to leverage that? Yep. Absolutely. And we have a question, gentlemen. Uh, at what point when you complete your feasibility study? Do you actually begin the engineering process, and what is the time frame for that process? Great question. Neither I, of these guys are engineers, just so you know that. I kind of see it as, as a reason the feasibility study exists is so you know whether or not that engineering study is a good investment. But that becomes more of a concrete investment. Mm -hmm. um, you would hope that when you're writing the RFP for the feasibility study that you make it clear enough that what you do want is enough of the engineering, the way that the information is going to be collected is valid. Mm -hmm. I guess there's been ways where we've seen communities or RFP for the feasibility study didn't put in the process or the information they wanted to see at the end. And so engineering firms were able to guess at how they wanted to come up with the actual cost estimates and to determine their own feasibility. Right. So, I guess to me it all comes down, I, I see it as two separate processes, but enough of the engineering is done or is done the right way that it can flow into how you want your engineering done. That's right. The engineering, the actual detailed engineering needed to create plans and specs that can go out to uh, uh, contractors is a pretty detailed uh, work and it, 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 is, a, it is an investment. 
um, and it will take at least three months or so, uh, and that's probably an optimistic timeline. So um, when you say go, that engineering firm is going to put a lot of people power behind that. They're going to be driving through your town, and they're going to be measuring things, and they're going to come back with a, a, a plan that's buildable, essentially, and that's going to cost you know quite a bit of money. So you're going to do that process after you're pretty darn sure this is something your community wants. I would say after you're pretty darn sure that there is a financial path yeah. to making it happen too, right? Yeah, and I think that's the other piece of the timeline that kind of gets to that question is when you've got that feasibility study at hand and you're making a decision on whether or not we want to go and enter a contract for that full engineering, exactly to Curtis's point, did we get all our ducks in a row on the other pieces of this before we enter engineering? Is this from a preliminary standpoint, something that we can finance? Have we thought about all the factors that might be there? Have we gone through some of those political considerations Todd had mentioned, uh, that process between feasibility and entering engineering contract, there's time potentially there for the board and other stakeholders to really uh, marinate on that information. So there's a timeline there, three to six months for engineering, and then you're gonna get that engineering back. Hopefully that's incorporated some of a business plan, but you're right. talking about from feasibility to go six to 12 months, that a potential process there. So again, as I get back to the seasonality considerations, right. That's another piece where we start losing a month, we lose a month going through this, now we lose winter, we lose a season, when are we actually doing a project? So I think we want to be conservative with that timing, but try to have all the professionals on board with, if we get it, don't get it done by here, we might as well just wait till here kind of considerations. So. And, and you know, right now the communities that are in the process of doing engineering, um, they're all in a similar timeline with, which was late summer, was press the go button for engineering, engineering being done uh, fall and early winter with the goal of having bids out, bids let in the, during the winter months so that the contractor or contractors that are hired to do that outside plant work are ready to go in the spring. Again, that's where that seasonal consideration, right? Yeah. If you took your bids in March or April, for example, and you say, okay, uh, XYZ construction ready to hire you let's go XYZ construction may have already lined up all the work they can handle for the rest of the year and therefore you, you may not get that full time and attention and resources until late in the year or maybe even the next construction season so and, and why we care and again talking about the financing in a startup period in terms of when are we going to outlay dollars and when are we going to owe dollars back yeah. We want to maximize that flexibility, but when we have to add an extra season to that, it delays the time we go live, delays the time we have revenues coming in the door, and changes the math on overall things. Right? And operationally, when you're going to hire key personnel, um, you know, a lot of people say, I want my, the telecom manager, the person that's going to run this system, I want them in place when construction starts. Great. If you hire them now, but you don't start construction until the middle of next year, you know, that person's maybe not going to be utilized. So again, that goes into your cash flow. Yeah. So any other questions there that we have online? It doesn't look like we do. Thank you for that one. That was a very good one. Um, with no other questions, as I see it, we'll uh, go ahead and get ready to stop the webinar. I do want to uh, do a couple of housekeeping items for everybody. Uh, we do have uh, upcoming events. We're, we're going to take December off for our Lunch and Learn webinars. It's just such a hard time to nail anybody down. And so we're going to come back and we'll set up an event in January sometime for a uh, Lunch and Learn webinar like we saw today. Um, we're also looking at a potential event in January, uh, details to be announced hopefully soon, uh, that will benefit people that are looking at extending broadband services in rural areas. And we will remind you that the date for the Community Broadband Summit 2019 is March 12th, 2019, obviously. And that's going to be at the Holiday Inn Northwest on Merle Hay Road in Des Moines. Uh, details again coming, but uh, that will be an event uh, where we'll invite people to come in and we'll have some informational sessions, a lot of networking time. And uh, this year we'll have an opportunity for uh, some of the C-band members who provide goods and services to talk a little bit about what they're doing. So mark that on your calendar and then uh, you know keep watching our municipal broadband uh, page uh, group on Facebook and also um, you can uh, follow uh, municipal, or I should say you can also follow uh, us on broadbandaction.com. 
So we'll end the webinar for now. Thank you, everybody. It looks like everybody's gone almost. So <laughs> appreciate you being on, and uh, we'll be back in touch soon. Thank you.